The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Steve Combe. I'm with Frontier Precision and I'll be the presenter for today's webinar. A couple uh, housekeeping items. We have everyone muted to minimize the disturbance during the webinar. So at the end of the webinar, you can submit questions via the chat pane that's on the lower right-hand side, and I'll read those questions aloud and hopefully address them to your satisfaction. For our agenda today, first we'll discuss common underwater ROV applications. Then we'll explore some unique ROV technology options and features so that you can, so that when we introduce the fleet and discuss differences, you'll have an understanding of the items under discussion. We'll then have a review of our line of ROVs, look at a comparison matrix that we generated to help you make an educated decision on which one is the best fit for your application. Then we'll summarize what we've learned today and uh, open it up for questions. So let's start off by looking at a couple of uh, common ROV applications. One of the more popular and growing one is search and rescue and recovery. So this may include lost objects or lost people. Uh, we're starting to see drones in use more and more by public safety agencies as they're a safer and more affordable alternative to a diver. And a lot of times we see those same public safety agencies using both aerial and submersible drones. Dam safety inspections are one of the most popular applications that we've seen for our underwater ROVs. And again, the primary driver for this being a popular application is that it's a much safer and more affordable alternative to a diver. Submerged pipe and pump inspections are right up there among popular applications. And a, another one, especially for customers that live along the coast, ship hole and prop inspections. Again, uh, probably with all of these, this is a more affordable, safer alternative to using a diver or lifting the boat to clean and examine for damage. Uh, an ROV can be deployed at the harbor and moved along to examine a number of crafts sitting in the vicinity. ROVs are also very useful to inspect underwater resources at aquaculture facilities. So these would include uh, rips and tears in nets, um, other objects that might be um, interfering with the procedures at the hatchery. And uh, there are even some, in, some tools on uh, some of our ROVs where you can actually make repair to the nets underwater with the ROV. And then pre-dive reconnaissance. ROVs can be used ahead of dive teams to make sure an area is safe from hazards such as sharp objects or predators, basically anything lurking below the surface that might may cause harm to a human entering the water. And uh, also large water tanks. Uh, most large water tanks have to be inspected and cleaned on a regular basis. And ROVs are a very useful tool for gathering images to look at so you can see before and after uh, video and pictures of the cleaning. And again, there are also tools that you can add to some of the ROV platforms to actually perform the cleaning. And then another application is uh, doing reconnaissance in inundated mines. One of the most hazardous areas to send a diver is in a submerged mine. Nobody knows uh, at all what's uh, lurking below the surface that can cause problems. So ROVs, again, a much better option uh, than sending a human diver down into an unknown environment. 
So there's just a few of the applications. I'm I'm sure there's a lot more, especially for uh, any of you out there that might be involved in research and uh, things like that. So to some extent, the sky's the limit. And again, as we look at a comparison matrix later on in the webinar, you'll see what tools can be added. So I've kind of rearranged the format of this a little bit. In previous webinars, I've introduced the ROV fleet and then dis discussed the add-ons that can be put on the ROVs. But I changed that up a little bit today, and I'm going to actually um, introduce you to some technology. So when we talk about that feature being available on a specific ROV, you'll understand exactly what it is that we're talking about. So one of the challenges that an ROV operator faces is uh, knowing the location of your ROV under the water relative to your position on the shore, on a dock, or on a boat, uh, especially if the water is murky. Uh, basically, without any additional tools on an, R on an ROV, you're kind of left to the image that's on the screen in front of you relative. So, for example, if you're moving it along a dam wall, you can say, okay, I can see this dam wall right here. If I'm moving this right or left, then I know the position relative to what I'm seeing on my screen. But if you're roaming over a large area with these things, there's some technologies that can be added to uh, three of the four ROVs in our fleet to help you get it, gain a really good understanding of where that uh, remote uh, operated vehicle is under the surface. Um, unlike um, land applications, uh, GPS doesn't work underwater, so we've got to use other technology. And uh, one of those technologies is uh, an ultra short baseline acoustic positioning system. We'll refer to it as USBL through the west of, rest of the webinar. So what the USBL is, is it uses a set of beacons, one on the ROV and one just below the water surface um, at or near your location. And then a GPS receiver is used at your position and tied into the same controller as the USBL system. So using triangulation, you can gain awareness of the relative position of your ROV. So I think that graphic kind of does the uh, technology a little bit of justice. And then I have a picture of one of the little transponders uh, right there. So this is kind of what it would look like on one of our manufactured screens. So you have uh, Wi-Fi enabled maps that allow you to see where both the controller and the ROV are located in relation to each other. So a very helpful technology. Another locating and positioning technology that you can use on your ROV, that's an option on some of ours, is a Doppler velocity log, so or DVL. So DVL is a sensor for subsea navigation, again, where GPS is not available. The acoustic, ses the acoustic sensor estimates the velocity relative to the sea bottom by sending out some long pulses along a minimum of three acoustic beams, each pointing in different directions. And then the device actually looks at and measures the Doppler shift that occurs between beam pairs. And that tells the instrument how fast it's moving uh, along the bottom of the lake, reservoir, or ocean. So that's the DVL. And that's an option on some of the ROVs. Another really useful technology is uh, having an optional imaging sonar on there. Uh, some of you may be working in some very murky or turbid waters where you can't get a good clean camera or video image of what it is that you're in inspecting or looking for. So putting an optional sonar on your ROV can give you basically a digital footprint of what it's looking at underneath the water. Another technology that's standard on some of our ROVs 
and um, optional on others is a laser scaler. So what a laser scaler is, it's a set of two LEDs that are fixed at a specific width, such as five centimeters. So when you're trying to measure something like a track or an object underwater, the water can distort the true size of an object. So looking at it with a laser scaler will give you an idea of the size relative to the width of the laser scaler. Okay, so that's what a laser scaler is. So when we're looking at that in our comparison matrix and discussing which ROVs um, have certain things, that's uh, what it is. Another and probably one of the most uh, popular options and accessories to get on a ROV is a robotic claw or a grabber. The claw allows you to pick up objects to examine by holding them in front of the camera or bring to the surface. Uh, maybe you're retrieving something important or there's a underwater communication cable or something that's being examined to see how good a shape it's in. So that's a robotic claw. You'll see when we're discussing this that some of our ROVs have different sizes of claws that can be used and other ones have rotating claws. So if you're grasping a vertical or a horizontal object, you don't need to tilt the whole ROV, you can just roll the claw. So kind of a neat, neat thing to have on your underwater ROV. So that's just a few of the things. Again, you'll see that uh, some of our line have a whole bunch of options and accessories that can be um, added to those, but those are some of the more popular ones for making your ROV useful, um, giving it some utility as well as knowing where it is underneath the water. So the next thing we're gonna do is introduce our ROV fleet. We actually have ROVs from two manufacturers and each one of those manufacturers has two um, general models that make up their fleet. So first we'll introduce the Deep Tracker line and we'll start out with the model DTG3 ROV. So this is what the uh, unit looks like uh, when it's shipped to you. Everything fits nice and organized in a um, case with uh, pre-cut uh, foam cutouts. So you have your ROV in there, you have your reel with the tether, your display, um, any extra batteries and uh, accessories that may go with it. The DTG-3 is a mini observation class underwater ROV built to provide operators the ability to quickly deploy and visually inspect underwater environments. Even in rough conditions, the DTG-3 provides a stable, clear and crisp HD video. And a, a unique feature of the DTG-3 and the uh, Revolution, the other model by Deep Tracker, is that operators can man manipulate viewing by dimming main and auxiliary lights for optimal inspections in a dark and low light environments, and then use a modern uh, interface. Uh, they have their own proprietary display, which has a clear, clean, outdoor, uh, visible seven inch screen. So you can get a good picture of what's happening underwater and then capture high definition video recording uh, equipped with a 4K camera and record video from 720p up to 4K. So here's kind of a, a schematic of the DTG-3. The uh, center picture is where I'd like you to focus your attention right now. That's uh, looking at the side of the instrument. And this is the unique feature with the camera. So if you're going up against a dam wall <laughs> or a um, hole or a prop of a ship, instead of moving the ROV up and down, you can hold that ROV in position and you can rotate that camera or pan it 270 degrees. So you can go clear down and look at the bottom, bring that camera up horizontally and then scan to see what's above 
the um, ROV. So really cool feature with the Deep Tractor products. The uh, DTG3 line has a number of packages. Uh, so you can buy this package and each one of them has some unique uh, things that are included with it. So the DTG3 starter gives you the ROV 50 meter tether, the um, controller that's shown in the picture, a hybrid power supply, a buoyancy weight set, and an operator manual. So, so for somebody that just wants a basic and expensive system to go do some inspections, the starter kit is a good way to get into an ROV. And then moving up um, in intelligence and capability, we have the DTG3 Smart that has the same um, features as the starter package, but now you have some um, intelligent sensors in there. So you can see on your screen the depth of the ROV, the temperature, and the um, angle or the, the, the heading of the ROV. And then you have a, um, an inertial measurement unit in there, an IMU, so you actually know the pitch and roll of, of the ROV as well. And then next we have the um, expert package that again includes all of the features on the previous one, plus you now have a standard laser scaler and a two function grabber arm included with it. And then we have the DTG3 Navigator series that again includes all of those same features. You have a longer cave, um, longer tether, um, sensors, uh, temperature, laser scaler, and the precision thruster is put in there. So if you look at the DTG3 models, they have two thrusters on each side that come standard and then this model also has a um, third thruster, which is kind of a vertical thrust thruster, so for moving it up and down within the water column. So there's a brief introduction of the DTG-3. We'll get into um, discussion of this a little bit more when we look at our comparison matrix. So the next uh, model in the deep tractor line is the Revolution model. You'll see it has a little bit different size and shape uh, than the um, DTG-3. There's six thrusters on the um, Revolution model, and it's engineered with carbon fiber and stainless steel, so you get uh, enhanced performance and a little bit faster movement underwater. So it's a completely reimagined uh, ROV. The patented pending revolving head allows operators to rotate the camera, manipulators, and sonar, all while stationary and holding in the water. So this model is well suited for offshore underwater inspections in various industries such as aquaculture, energy, naval defense, uh, marine research, and the like. So in this slide, you can actually see that 260 degree camera rotation. Pretty cool feature. And again, just like the DTG3, unique to the Deep Trekker products. And that sh schematic shows that uh, very well right here. Looking at the image on the left, which is a side view of that, shows the tether coming out of the top, the robotic arm in the front, and then the camera tilt uh, 260 degrees on this model. The Revolution has the deepest operational specification of all of the ROVs that we'll be discussing today. So it can go up to a thousand feet depth uses the uh, same controller with seven inch uh, LCD and has the same video and camera capabilities.
one of the features that are really unique and cool about both of these is that you can have multiple um, sensors on the ROV, so you can really load these things up. And then we have the nav model that uh, has has the most capabilities. One thing to introduce with the Deep Tracker ROVs is uh, an intelligent uh, technology platform called Bridge. So, Bridge is an operating system that leverages the latest in technology to provide solutions that are intuitive and easy to use. So in rough conditions, the bridge platform allows for stable and clear video. And importantly, it allows operators to manipulate viewing by adjusting onboard lighting for inspection and varying light environments. And it basically ties all of your sensors together. So if you, if you have your ROV loaded up with a um, DVL, with a USBL, maybe a robotic arm and laser scaler, you need to have a means to combine all of these component components together so you can control those from the uh, control panel there and have them all work seamlessly. And this is what the uh, bridge technology platform from Deep Trekker allows you to do. Okay, next we want to introduce the line of products from Chasing Innovation. Chasing has two um, research resource grade ROVs on the market. Uh, one is the M2, which they introduced uh, barely in the, uh, very early in the year in 2020, and the M2 Pro, which was brought to market um, um, third or fourth quarter of uh, 2020. So these units look very similar. The M2 Pro is just slightly larger than the uh, standard M2. Um, has a lot uh, deeper uh, capabilities, longer tether, and more options and accessories can be added to it. So what is common to both of the uh, M2 packages, the M2 Standard and the M2 Pro, is each one of them have eight vector thrusters for omnidirectional movement, uh, basically in all direction. And then they have a uh, combination aluminum alloy and a plastic body. The um, M2, standard M2 has a rate of, rated speed of three knots. The M2 Pro is four knots. The uh, standard M2 can go 100 meters in depth and 200 meters radius, where the M2 Pro has four knots of speed, and it can go um, as deep as 200 meters and have up to, I believe, about uh, 400 meters of tether. We'll um, look at that in a minute when we, com when we compare these. The uh, standard M2 is what we call a bring your own device type of display. So you get a controller as part of the package, but to view the underwater environment, record video and pictures, you supply your own um, smartphone. So iOS or uh, Android tablet or smartphone, and there's a bracket to put that into. The um, M2 Pro, like the uh, Deep Tracker devices, has a proprietary display that has more of your standard ruggedized and outdoor visible screen on it. Now, something that's uh, a really cool and common feature, whether you're bringing your own display and putting it in the controller or using a propri proprietary display, is that there are um, HDMI inputs into this. So if you have a generator on site, want to put up a canopy because you're working with a group, you can have a large screen monitor. So all kinds of people can view what's going on there, as well as other people can link their um, devices to this. So you can have 
multiple people viewing the underwater environment, not just the ROV operator. So here's an example with the uh, standard M2 and the ability through the HDMI cable to share the picture and imagery on a large screen. And something that's common with um, all of the units are uh, swappable batteries. So if you're doing a study that's taking a long time and your battery power gets low, you can pull, drive those up to the surface, quickly exchange the battery with a newly charged one, slide it in place, and dive down again and complete your study. And in this comparison matrix we'll bring up, we'll actually look at the difference and battery life between the various units. The um, chasing uh, supports uh, some of the same options and accessories as we uh, introduced. The, the main difference between the M2 and the M2 Pro on here is the M2 can only have one accessory at a time interface to it, where the M2 Pro, like the Deep Tracker ROVs, can have multiple um, accessories on one ROV at the same time. And then similar um, cameras and uh, video with uh, image stabilization on the chasing products. One thing that uh, Chasing puts a lot of time and attention to is what they call anti-stuck motors. So as you're getting down close to the um, sea floor, there's often a lot of um, there's often a lot of um, silt that gets sucked up in the um, motors, and you want to make sure that that doesn't stop the props from spinning freely in there. So some attention has gone into that. And then a really slick feature for getting your imagery off of the instrument easily are the removable SD memory cards. So you can um, open those ports up, slide those out, put those in your computer, and to easily get your underwater imagery that's been recorded while you've been doing your study. The um, Chasing M2 and M2 Pro ROVs have an optional electronic reel that you can get with these. So as you're driving the uh, ROV underwater, it just freely spools the cable out. But when you're getting upwards two, three, four hundred meters of cable spooled out there, uh, rather than just manually winding it back on a reel, it's kind of a neat feature just to push the button on the side of this and have it automatically take up that spare tether. Okay, so I put together this little comparison matrix of the um, ROVs in our fleet. So you can kind of differentiate and uh, based on what your needs are, find out which one is the best option for you. You can look at this from also from a cost standpoint. So generally the price of the ROV increases as you move from left to right across the screen here. So the features we have to compare are the maximum depth for each ROV, the uh, speed that the ROV can keep up with. Uh, sometimes the speed is an important issue if people are using the ROV and rivers. For example, if you've got a large river and there's a highway that crosses it and the DOT wants to do inspections of those bridge pillars and pilings underneath the water, uh, you wanna make sure that your ROV speed can actually keep up with the currents that would uh, be prevalent ar around those uh, bridge pilings or, or abutments. Uh, battery life is another thing to um, to compare there. So why there's a little asterisk on some of those is the uh, battery life that is given are with a uh, swappable battery. So to obtain the eight hours with the DTG3 and the Revolution, it's basically taken into account that each battery is going to last you approximately four hours. 
The cool thing about that is, is those actually ship standard with two battery packs. With the M2 and the M2 Pro, there are spare batteries available. They're not standard. You just have to order those separately. Um, so if you're obtaining five hours with the M2 Pro, that's actually with using two batteries. Um, the next thing to compare is um, the standard lighting um, on the instruments. So the lumens is basically just a brightness uh, coefficient. So essentially, what kind of brightness are you seeing underwater there? The um, ROVs actually have the ability where you can add um, other additional lighting, such as large floodlights that can be mounted to those, but um, this specification is for the standard lighting. So you can also com compare camera resolution uh, for each one of the ROVs, um, video capability, uh, the 270 degree and 260 degree panning that's listed in video that would of course apply to the camera too, and that's just giving the ability as we demonstrated earlier, to actually pan or move that camera all the while your ROV is holding stationary. The next one is we introduced the uh, USB-L technology, the positioning technology for there, so you can see what platforms that's available on. And then the same thing with the D DVL, the Doppler velocity log. If that's something that appeals to you, and of course, you want to see what uh, platforms you can get that on. And then the same thing with sonar. So generally, just as we discussed with the increasing price as you move from left to right, the same thing is with capabilities. So the uh, instruments on the right hand side of the screen definitely have a lot more capabilities. You'll see that with maximum tether length. Um, so even though we're talking, you know, 200 or 305 meters of depth, the longer tether gives you room to roam away from where the operator is. And then the next thing is um, having your standard sensor um, suite on there. For example, um, getting a ROV depth and an RO, a water temperature and an ROV heading on there. Um, is that included or is it something that I can get uh, optionally on those? And then just a comparison of the thrusters on there. Again, some of the technology is so unique uh, when you're looking at um, the um, size and shape of the DTG-3 versus the other ones. Uh, you know, it really doesn't need that many thrusters, but it was just kind of a comparison point. And then we discussed the differences in displays. Were the M2 um, iOS and Android display something you provide yourself? The M2 Pro, the DTG3, and the Revolution all having proprietary remote controllers with their own display. And then I just wanted to look at some of the more common um, options that you can add to this. There are even a lot more available than I've listed on here. Um, so we're looking at things like who can support a robotic claw? Is it optional or standard? A laser scaler. Is it supported? Is it optional or standard? And again, keep in mind when you're comparing things like the M2 versus the M2 Pro, the M2 can only have one of those options on it at a time, where the M2 Pro can support multiple ones, as can the Deep Tracker, DTG3, and Revolution. Um, wire cutter. Uh, water samplers, sediment samplers, digital calipers, all things that might factor into what you want to use your ROV for. So this matrix kind of lets you know whether or not you can even get that option um, on the ROV that you're thinking about. Um, all of them support auxiliary lights and auxiliary cameras. Uh, there's also hydrophones. What that last option is, is a mortality toolkit. So if you're working in a hatchery environment, for example. Uh, you can actually have a tool where you can go down there if there are dead fish carcasses. Sounds kind of bizarre, I know. Uh, floating in the water on the bottom, there's a toolkit that you can use to actually have the ROV bring that up to the surface. So probably some of the most uh, popular features and options and accessories to compare against. There are a couple more, but I think these are the big ones and kind of helps differentiate between the different models. 
So that was kind of a summary of our ROV technology. Just want to remind you all that we have a lot of water resource and GPS instrumentation that you can get through Frontier uh, Precision, such as water quality probes, level sensors, flow meters, acoustic Doppler current profilers, and the like. So now I'll just open this up to questions. And again, if you look at your um, control panel there, there's a, a question pane near the bottom. So you can go ahead and uh, type your question in there. And um, I'll read the questions off. And hopefully address those. It looks like we already have quite a few questions here. You have to forgive me. This uh, service that we use actually has a very small line to read. So if, let me see if I can get up close and read this. Okay, the first question is, is there any operator licensing required to operate? And the answer for the underwater ROVs is no. Um, I know that's uh, applicable to um, aerial ROVs in some locations and instances, but not at all with underwater ROVs. So, uh, good question. Next question is, is the sensor data logged? Um, and I, uh, I assume in this case, the sensor data that uh, we're discussing is, are the, is the water quality um, sensors that you would put on there. So in, in those instances, you would basically need to have a probe that has its own internal memory on there. So before you deployed it and attached the probe to the ROV, you would start a, a separate logging run uh, going on that probe because that data wouldn't be logged to uh, any of the controllers, uh, basically just the imagery. So another good question. Let's sort down through and see what other ones are there. Are max depths regulated by the unit or by the operator? Um, it's a, it's a little bit of both. So each one of them has their maximum submersion capability, which is most likely based on the construction of the unit. Now, it, it's not regulated by the unit in the extent, and for example, if we look at the M2 that's rated to 100 meters, it won't automatically stop at that point unless all you have is 100 meters of cable, then it would, of course. So basically, you just need to look at the depth on your screen and pretty much say, okay, this unit is only um, rated for 200 meters, I better not uh, deep dive it any more than that, um, or else you could compromise the, the seals and the construction of that ROV. Okay. Okay. The next question refers to something like a, a motor or other feature being damaged. Uh, please explain the process and service time for that uh, particular part. So, so excellent question. Uh, with these ROVs, you can actually perform most of the service uh, yourself if it involves um, things like the props, um, rotors. You can actually buy kits to replace those. So the specific answer to the question is, probably determined by the extent of the damage. If it's something internal, then the unit would need to go back to the shop for repair. If it's something that's more mechanical on the unit, like the any of the options, like the grabbers or the props and stuff like this, a lot of times you can perform that service yourself um, just by buying the appropriate parts. So you'd be needing to work with us to identify exactly what the issue is and get you the appropriate part. If uh, it does need to go back, yeah, the unit would need to be shipped back to the manufacturer to, to take care of that. 
Okay, the next question is, um, any experience having an ROV carry a water quality sawn to collect water quality data? Um, Deep, Deep Tracker must have some experience with that because they actually have multi-parameter water quality songs on their price list. And uh, through a fortunate coincidence, it's exactly the same brand of uh, multi-parameter quality song that we've been uh, so selling and supporting since 2003. So we, we have a lot of experience with that. Uh, they've obviously have deployed instruments with that. We, we personally have not, but the, the factory has, and we can get you in touch with somebody there if you have some more specific questions about that. Okay, next question. Okay, this must have to do with the um, water sampler or sediment sampler. How much volume can be collected in the water sampler? Tens or one hundreds of I assume, I assume that's 10 or 100s of uh, milliliters. Um, I've got a note here of who asked that question. I'll look on the um, price list. I don't have that in front of me, but um, there are different components for different uh, volumes on there. So I'll uh, address that uh, offline. Next question is, um, When you change a battery, will it go back down to the same location without needing to drive it there? Um, that would be really cool, but uh, the answer is you basically have to drive that down to the same location. But if you're using the USB-L technology, what's kind of nice is you could uh, record waypoints uh, along the way. So as you're going up or down, you can actually navigate to those waypoints. And this also brings up one other cool feature that I uh, neglected to touch on with these ROVs is that um, all of them have a really neat feature where you can hold it in place. You can basically lock the location of it. So if you want to hover at a certain point and there's underwater currents uh, from any directions, you could lock it there so it'll maintain that position for you so you can take a good sample, take a good picture or video at that point without having to use your controller joysticks and hold it in that position. So you just lock it there and it'll, it'll hold steady. Okay, let's see what else we have. What is the weight of the 800 uh, meter tether? I don't have that. I'll uh, make a note of that. Uh, these questions will all be recorded um, for us, so I'll basically uh, get back in touch with you on what the weight of that, that 800 meter tether is. Those tethers are actually pretty light. They're they're really strong as far as the uh, foot pound strength of what they can haul in. So obviously strong enough that if uh, for some reason something uh, dies on you or you have an issue, you can no problem at all pull that rov back up to the surface using that tether even if it's fully loaded and has a sample on it but i'll find that out i've never been asked that question before okay our next question is if a unit is purchased from frontier are maintenance agreements available Yes, uh, in fact, um, one of the manufacturers has a three level um, kind of warranty maintenance agreement where you can even have a, uh, uh, a loaner um, set up as part of that maintenance agreement. So if you're using it frequently for your job and you can't uh, go a day without it, if there's an issue that there's basically a unit build up and waiting for you at the factory to be shipped out as a spare so so good question so yes yeah, so those can be part of the purchase is a uh, maintenance agreement even with a free loaner 
And then those agreements even include extended warranty options with them as well. Okay, let's see what other questions we have here. Um, well, one thing I wanted to bring up is kind of a differentiator, and this goes along with the question that somebody was asking about uh, service and repair of the instruments are the uh, chasing units. So these are the yellow uh, M2 and M2 Pro drones. Those are manufactured in China. The uh, Deep Trekker line, so the DTG3 and the Revolution, these are manufactured in Canada. So if uh, people have experience one way or another uh, working with uh, um, foreign products, that is something to consider that sending something back to Canada may possibly be easier than uh, than uh, the lead time and turnaround of sending a, a product back to China. So just one thing to think about when you're doing your comparison there. We don't want to disparage any buddy's uh, country of origin, but uh, those are the realities when, when dealing with products. Okay, what else do we have here? I think that's it as far as our questions. Um, if there's no more, you can see uh, two contacts there with uh, email address and phone numbers. There will also be a follow-up email that will automatically be sent out by the software. So if you have additional questions, uh, you can just reply to that email if uh, you lose track of the email address and phone numbers here. So I'll scan the question pane one more time here, see if I'm missing anything. If not, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this webinar. I hope it was educational and beneficial for you. And we look forward to working with you in the future and having you attend additional Frontier webinars. Thank you.